Hi everyone, I'm Ian Galloway with NXP Semiconductor, um, and uh, we've please, Gerald. Please give a quick help from NXP as well. Yes. So we're only a semiconductor company. We make chips. We don't make drones. Um, a lot of you are software people. You may not be familiar with NXP. Um, the roots are Motorola at one point became Freescale Semiconductor. Uh, Philips uh, out of the uh, Netherlands uh, became NXP. And now, not that long ago, a few, few years back, we merged and became the new NXP. So it's a com combination of all those um, technologies in one place. So we're a very broad line supplier with uh, microcontrollers, microprocessors, sensors, RF power, um, uh, connectivity. We do ASICs for people. We've got foundries around the world, and that's our core business. So it's quite a large company. We're the largest supplier to the automotive industry and um, focus on uh, things like ADAS and self-driving cars, uh, functional safety. We supply a lot of medical customers. We uh, and industrial. So that's really when people come to NXP, where they're not looking for the absolutely cheapest part. Uh, they're looking for parts that they know they can build into products and have a long life. Uh, a lot of our parts components we guarantee 10 or 15 years. Um, and um, we just announced that we're acquiring the wireless assets of Marvell for Bluetooth and Wi-Fi going forward. But um, who are we? Or like, why are we involved with drone, with PX4 and drone code? Um, and and really, the drone team is what's driving it. It's not. Um, we're actually in a in the process of sort of taking all this back to our corporate and saying, hey, this is something we need to focus on. Um, it's a difficult sell because obviously the drone industry is tiny compared to h hundreds of thousands of vehicle pieces that are made every every month. So <clears throat> we're a small team inside of NXP. We're not NXP thousands and thousands of people. We're five people and some students. And, think, and we, we pull upon resources as best we can. So we're really um, uh, committed in, and involved as personally to the uh, open source uh, community. And um, we feel from a strategy point of view, you know, we're not going to compete on the cheapest low-end stuff, but our strategy point of view is let's, let's look at what we can bring in terms of high reliability, high reliability hardware with long life uh, for drones and rovers. Uh, and I said it before, we're not a drone manufacturer, so all the things we're going to show here today are actually just reference designs where we want to help enable it uh, going forward into the, into the industry, into the community. Um, and the other part that's different about having a drone team here is that we can provide sort of unprecedented, unprecedented access into NXP as a corporate body and all the things we do. Typically, small companies are dealt through distributors and distributors, salespeople, et cetera. And not, they don't get to talk to the engineers that are busy servicing Continental or Volkswagen or Toyota. Um, but having said that, there's challenges that remain. I mean, we have these amazing parts on the horizon that we just can't get yet until, until it's getting over that, that hurdle with the, the lead customers. But we do our best. All right, so the two objectives, I'm trying to think what are the objectives here. One is to show you some of the things we're working with, some, some of the stuff, um, and then let you know that we're here and we're friendly and you can talk with us. And I'll let... Uh, Gerald, go in, into more detail on some of the projects we've been involved in. Thank you. Uh, your first short introduction <clears throat> to myself. I'm Gerald Pekla. I'm located in Hamburg, uh, Germany. I'm an Austrian, living in Hamburg, being in Switzerland, trying to talk English. Okay, that's how it is. But uh, uh, to show or give you an example on our commitment, we're not only deep in ICs, uh, we are also deep in the drones, so we're not just talking about uh, what we know from others. Uh, those hardware you see here was built by myself, so we are building the stuff uh, ourselves, we are testing the stuff ourselves, we are flying the stuff ourselves, so we have some experience, some. Um, about the DLR project, um, we have two representatives from DLR here as well, so uh, if you have questions on that, you can ask it on. So, hi, Nikolaus and Jonas. Um, uh, that's a DLR internal project, uh, and um, 
partners um, are in there um, and uh, doing the project together with DLR. Who is in there and what's the project about? Um, so uh, we have Flynex, uh, that is a company who provides uh, geographical data and uh, services for um, drone yard uh, registration uh, for uh, uh, geographical data. In principle, but in principle, that's a whole workflow infrastructure they have. Coptocraft, who is doing a multi-link uh, system for remote control and telemetry with uh, DFS, the German Airspace uh, Authority. Autarian is in there. Uh, uh, Windrove is a network uh, within the Hamburg area uh, connecting uh, drone operators with manufacturers so they are supporting. And that ZL is the center of applied uh, error nautical research uh, located in Hamburg as well. Uh, and we are working together with DLR on this project, and the project is about safe integration of UAVs into an airspace. So it's uh, showing that an air, air traffic management system, uh, system is really capable to manage all those UAVs operated in, in an urban airspace. Uh, we are connecting all the different uh, services together that the EU plans to implement uh, with the u space concept in future. And we are demonstrating in this uh, project that it's really working with the systems we have uh, defined and developed uh, during the project and uh, the hardware we have set up for that. Um, there was already the first uh, demonstration done in Hamburg. Uh, it was a bridge inspection. So we have a famous bridge over River Alp in Hamburg. It's the Kölbrand Bridge. <coughs> and there were several uh, drones used, so three drones from DLR. Uh, two of them were uh, equipped with uh, PIXOG FMUs and running PX4. And also a flight path conflict scenario was uh, part of the demonstration uh, to showcase that this use space concept and uh, an airspace authority and resulting uh, uh, information towards a deconfliction system does work. So we were successful there. Um, there will be soon a video coming out uh, published by DLR uh, on this uh, demo, uh, but I think it's not yet there. Um, yes, please. Um, the DGR, DGI drone um, was doing one task. We had uh, three different flights in there, uh, but I don't know exactly. Uh, Nicolas, do you know maybe what the DGI, the, uh, the Mantris uh, task was in the project? So um, uh, one was for navigation, uh, SORA was checked, and also the conflict scenario. That, that was, in principle, the answer. Um, what was our contribution in the project? <clears throat> so we have provided uh, hardware and software for drone e-registration and e-identification. Because the project is... Uh, Aligning a bit with the steps uh, in the U-Space concept. So the U1 is about drone e-registration and e-identification. And that we have showcased in this project that we are using an NFC tag. And the purpose of the NFC tag was holding a um, 
pilot license or an insurance license initially, uh, allowing the, uh, the operator to uh, register the drone at the UTM, uh, drone registration service. Uh, that we have demonstrated successfully with that, together with Flanax. So we were using their uh, registration system for that, and then uh, we used a secure element, unique ID, and the secure element, secure storage for holding uh, the certificate that was uh, published by the system. And also the message was, or the message is... Uh, able to be signed. We have defined an own message for that. I will come to that on one of the, not on one, on this next slide. Um, the first thing we realized, okay, we need something to track a vehicle. Yeah? Uh, and there needs to be a, a message that can be used by an uh, airspace uh, navigation service provider, ANSP, uh, like German DLR. Uh, for tracking drones and identifying drones within an UTM system. The existing messages were not good enough, so we have uh, defined uh, together with DLR, with Atarian and others, and uh, one serves all message, you can call it, uh, that supports um, uh, identification of the vehicle and uh, uh, possibility to uh, do a deconfliction uh, de in advance. So it has the ID of the, uh, the vehicle, it has also the trajectory in, so the next waypoint is sent out with the message, um, and that is used then uh, for tracking and deconfliction and identification towards the UTM system. Um, what we have seen there is definitely a redundancy is needed. So you cannot rely only on one data link. We have uh, used the multi-link solution from Coptagraft as well as our D2X. Um, and we have seen uh, a problem, for example, with LTE in, um, um, if you go out not in urban, if you're not in an urban space, but outside cities, LTE, LTE is using 868 megahertz, yeah? and uh, the multi-link solution was also using 868 megahertz for their RC remote control. So we had seen then conflicts and uh, interferences between the two systems. So that are things you're seeing during such a trial. So definitely you need redundancy because there would be occasions that you cannot foresee uh, in advance. Uh, what we have also seen that uh, air traffic control needs to have the data with very low latency because if you're flying at a certain speed uh, and you have a an, an separation criteria, and we, I think we have set there 20 meters and the first warning at, at 70 meters or 50 meters roundabout, there need to be very low latency. So you need to have a transmission system that is able to provide the data very fast towards the UTM system. Uh, what we have also seen that our uh, 802.11p communication, I have it here and I will talk about this later, was very reliable and uh, we have just uh, uh, got a um, white paper on this published on um, uh, IEEE. Explore website and uh, the advantage you guys are having here in uh, being connected to the ETH network. ETH is having free access to IEEE Explore, so you can download it for free. Uh, I've uploaded already the presentation to chat, so if you open it there, go to slide number eight, uh, you will find the link to download the white paper on. Uh, the 802.11p communication. It's a mesh network on 5.8 gigger and uh, working very reliable. Thank you, Ian. I need to speed up. Uh, cooperative awareness. Um, um, what I've said already, it needs to include uh, a mission and f uh, needs to be incorporated in mission and flight <coughs> execution. Uh, it doesn't work if you follow your path, then you, another uh, drone is crossing and you're smashing into that. So, uh, and therefore, we have an, 
change request currently uh, running uh, to incorporate the COTM global position for collision avoidance. And one hint to Lawrence and the team, please pick this up again, because no one is working on that at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know Lawrence. I didn't have your number. <laughs> Design decision uh, uh, for the UTM global uh, position. Yeah, redundancy needed. Uh, communication standard is needed. That's also important. I'm uh, personally involved in two EuroK working groups. One is e-identification. The other one is geofencing. So where we define the standards uh, for the EU. And uh, I don't see any very muffling being discussed. So no one is talking about muffling. They talk about uh, things uh, uh, like the airspace service providers are uh, uh, using this protocol, but no one incorporates muffling. And I don't like this. So there needs to be more effort from people uh, pushing muffling towards a standard because it's very lightweight. It serves the needs, I would say, but we need to be uh, get it in the, the standards. Cooperative awareness, I mentioned already uh, what happened. I'm, I'm, I'm going back. That was the issue. Sorry for that. Okay, next one is the D2X reference design because we have uh, used that there. Um, I have the hardware here, so that's, that's our crown station we have used, uh, or one of the crown stations, as stated uh, before, self-made housing. I'm reusing other stuff, so it doesn't look that nice, but it works. The same board is here on the throne. Uh, in principle, that's an, uh, based on the uh, vehicles network, uh, safety network, um, 802.11p from automotive industry. Uh, ITS G5 is the protocol usually uh, run on this device. We have made here a custom implementation for the drones because we need to have something. Two minutes left, damned. I'm, <laughs> I'm behind schedule. Um, and uh, it's, we think it perfectly fits for drone operation as well because uh, the requirements for cars were high approaching speed, so it's designed for up to 500 kilometers per hour. Uh, very low latency, it's below one millisecond we have seen. Uh, a very reliable data link up to 27 Mbit data rate and uh, um, capabilities work with reflections. If you operate in an urban airspace, you have a lot of reflections where a normal Wi-Fi usually gives up. That's a problem there. So. Um, we have successfully tested this in the project and with DLR, uh, and we like to uh, move with that forward towards the drone industry. Secure element is also something we have used um, in this project. Uh, secure element is a hardware root of trust. Uh, why we can say this? Because also the supply chain for building the device is secured. There are certain standards you need to fulfill to build a hardware secure element. We are certified doing this. Uh, you need to have secure storage, secure uh, production environment, all those kind of things. Um, a secure element provides a secure storage, uh, provides uh, cryptographical <coughs> processes, so elliptic curve based, TSL setup can be done. Uh, encryption authentication of an host process. So we use it here for the authentication. Uh, we use it on our ESC. I will come to that uh, in, in, on the next slide. For example, for secure boot up, because we have made an ESC reference design where we like to run third party software on beside proprietary software from the original designer. So all those things can be done with a secure element. Sorry, I need to go fast now, <laughs> otherwise Ian <laughs> will hit me. The ESC. Um, that's for us a reference design. We have picked Flyduino. Why Flyduino? They are designing uh, ESCs and flight controllers for drone racing since 2000, so they are very experienced in that. It's a small company, and they are sitting in Hamburg, so 
for me it was easy to approach them. Um, what we have done, um, and um, drone ESC based on automotive grade hardware. So automotive safety certified ICs we are using there, so the S32, okay. Um, the, we have a system basis chip with redundant power supply on there. Uh, the the pre-driver is also automotive grade. That's the main ICs on that, and it flies. So that's a picture from the first test flight I've done. That's the test vehicle here. So it's looking ugly, but it flies. And I will do further tests tomorrow, because tomorrow I'm at the developer uh, of the ESC, uh, Felix Niesen, who is, by the way, also the inventor of D-Shot. So uh, very known, uh, well known in this uh, domain. And he's just working on uh, porting UAV CAN to this device. So might be of interest for you guys as well. Uh, that's the block diagram. Uh, so system basis chip, S32K, uh, automotive create MCU, gate driver, GT3000, and the secure element. As stated, uh, there, the secure element can be used for secure boot up so that you make sure that your software, which is in principle the main IP, because the hardware design is not that complicated, the, the software is the main IP can be protected because in the software you can implement during boot up, it checks uh, with the secure element if the right certificate is there so that it is really running on the hardware where it should, where it should run. That's easily possible with that. Ultra-wideband, not used in the project yet, but will be used for sure. <clears throat> what is ultra-wideband? Ultra-wideband is a technology running on, we use it on 6.5 giga, which uses the uh, RF signal time of flight to precisely do distance measurements. Uh, that's a picture from a test I have done recently with one of our students uh, working on his master thesis on ultra wideband. And during his master thesis, he will design a custom board with drone code, connector standard, uh, and a system we can use as a reference design for drone precision takeoff and landing. So uh, performance data, as you see here on the screen, we reached a reliable one, uh, uh, nearly over uh, 100 meter. We can have plus minus five centimeter accuracy. Uh, and we will do the onboard as stated, together with uh, uh, Altair and PX4, uh, doing then also the software integration and having uh, already designed for uh, demonstrating that it is capable to provide the performance. Uh, that's the block diagram. As you see, uh, we have several debug uh, connectors. We have UART, we have uh, I2C. Uh, uh, SBI we don't have because we use it for the communication to the ranger system, but we also have then CAN and we will put UAV CAN on this as well on a later stage. But maybe also internet, uh, ethernet if, if needed. A spin-off of this, and that was uh, Ian pushing me doing, <laughs> uh, we thought, okay, we are doing a small board for the ultra-wideband. Uh, it serves our need there. We make already all the connectivities that <coughs> could be used for something else as well. Why not making a small adapter board? And that's what we are working in parallel on. It's a small adapter board for UAV CAN. So it will provide UART, I2C, SBI. It will have a secure element as well. And uh, for UAV CAN or for CAN, we use the uh, JSDGH connector standard. For everything else, it will be solder pads to be uh, more flexible for you guys. The question is, should it have one CAN board or does it need to have two? That's something. Two votes for two. Okay, <laughs> we'll make two. That's it. All right. I'm going to... Sorry for the overtime. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go very fast. We're okay? For, okay. Um, all right. 
When we started into looking into drones as a company, we said, oh, this is sort of what we end up needing. This is the kind of block diagram we ended up with. And we realized how complicated it was. And that's one of the reasons we really joined Drone Code and want to be involved with the PX4 project, because it, 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 it's the only way we could address this kind of complexity with such a small team and uh, take advantage of the software that's available. So we really wanted to get our foot in the water and start with a flight management unit. Uh, we thought we had to have some some real experience under our belt, and so we built the first, our first flight management unit and eventually built this Hover Games drone development kit. Um, and it is a complete kit that we provide, which includes the telemetry, GPS, it's ready to build. It's not a drone, it's a drone development kit. It ships with zero software uh, and a, de a debugger, so you program it yourself. It's based on a Kinetis microcontroller, one of our mic ARM M4 microcontrollers. I wouldn't say it's, uh, it's not state-of-the-art, but it's a FMU V4 compatible type of uh, flight controller. Uh, it does ship... Oh, is that going automatically? Okay. Um, the, um, and it has all the standard interfaces you'd like to see. The important thing is it's a one-stop shop for a, a development tool. It'd be great for universities or people wanting to learn about uh, drone development. Uh, it does, it's quite complete. It has a remote control and the telemetry and a debugger, you know, stickers and wrench keys, hex wrench keys. Yeah, there we go. The normal drone code com connectors. Um, and the two highlights, I guess I'd say, where we differentiate ourselves is that it has a TJA 1100, which is a two-wire automotive Ethernet part. So it's an unshielded twisted pair. And then the uh, secure element that... Uh, uh, Gerald mentioned earlier. We do include a variety of uh, sensors on board, mo more than just ours. Um, and we had some great feedback uh, already on the Ethernet and uh, then learning over time, work working with this open source community that you know, we're really interested in getting moving this up to a CAN-FD type of interface. That's a block diagram. I'll just skip through. These slides are all posted. I did want to mention one of the advantages of 2R Ethernet is, you know, it's, it's got, um, it's magnet, it doesn't require any magnetic, so a uh, uh, little bit less weight, um, and it's quite simple to implement, it, and uh, it's still Ethernet over the bus, just in a different form factor. So it's quite nice, you can go about 15 meters maximum. Uh, we also had another project internal to the company called an IoT development board, Rapid IoT, and I thought, hey, why don't we take that and... Um, uh, it have an interface board over to the drone in ecosystem. I think we have slide <laughs> timings on. Okay. Um, the interesting thing here is it's a mic another microcontroller. It's got some radios built in, uh, sensors, and 802.15.4 radio. So yesterday, Pavel was talking about maybe UAV CAN will run over an 802.15.4 radio in the future, and you could start prototyping on this tomorrow. Um, it's basically a board. The big thing is it's got these little click modules. So from an IoT perspective, you can pick up any one of one of 400 different boards and plug in LoRa or a gas sensor or an ultraviolet sensor, and now you have mobile IoT. Um, and out of this, we decided, we've got this drone, so let's make a challenge, uh, uh, and we start Hover Games Challenge. So it's meant to be an ongoing coding competition uh, with prize, prizes. We're using it to bring more people into the PX4 open source community, um, bring university students and, uh, into, into it as well, but also engineers and programmers. Our, our customers tend to be, you know, Whirlpool and General Motors and, and medical companies that are surprisingly interested in drones. Uh, as far as I know, every car company has a drone program and they don't talk about it. Um, it's a complete kit. It has... <laughs> <laughs> This has a um, complete kit. It has Git book documentation. We followed all the same patterns that, uh, that PX4 it is. So. Um, and our first challenge is called Fight Fires with Flyers. So we'd invite um, anyone that wants to join can join, but also to mention it to friends and family and uh, colleagues or university students. It's not... Uh, uh, so the idea is um, um, it's a very broad, broad swath here, like... Um, uh, help, fire, help firefighters in any way you can see possible with drones while using the underlying technology. We include the rapid IoT in the, uh, in, in, uh, people that apply, for people that apply a pixie cam, which is a very simple camera, and a heat sensor. So it's kind of representative. It's not really commercial uh, level. Um, when you apply, the people that um, apply and are chosen get a discounted all this for $300. Now, um, assuming you're not going to join. Um, we did want to offer an offer here for PX4 um, 
developers. So this, if you want to take a picture, um, you can use this discount code if you feel like picking up one of these drones uh, with the two discounts. The radio, telemetry radio is ordered separately depending on which region you're in. If it's, oops, sorry. If it's uh, 413 or 915. Am I done on time? Are we? Yeah, you're done. Okay. All right. I'll leave it there. I, um, I'll have one more slide if that's okay. But I'd I like to mention something. Um, we launched it internally uh, before we launched it public, and we oh. had great success internally. So we have uh, thought about, yeah, 10 teams, and we will give away 10 drones internally. At the end, we have more than 100 people from NXP internally and 50 teams worldwide yeah. working on this drone. So we hope that we as NXP can contribute in future a lot into the PX4 ecosystem with uh, new code and uh, new hardware to support. So we continue to build more reference designs, more pieces for that'll, that'll fit the PX4 ecosystem. Um, as a continuation, Hover Games is not one challenge, it goes on and on. Our next challenge will include this new reference module for a battery management system. The slides are published, but it is a battery, manage, uh, battery management, smart battery management system using all automotive grade components and um, could potentially get it to the next level where we have battery health monitoring, not just battery state of charge. And uh, the prototype board looks like this, and we'll try to do something to make it available widely for, for developers. So we'll, uh, we'll stop there, and please come and see us. If uh, happy to answer any questions and uh, move on from there. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Yeah.